He humiliated the most powerful country in the world. But his relationship with two Swedish women and their claims of sexual assault may yet destroy Julian Assange. You shouldn't write such text messages if you had been raped by that person the night before. I will not tell any media of how I'm going to represent the women in, in court. I'm sorry. Sex, lies, the Swedish justice system, the founder of WikiLeaks, and somewhere in the background, an angry and embarrassed US government. A tangled web indeed. Welcome to Four Corners. Julian Assange may have suspended his fate at the hands of a Swedish court by claiming political asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, but the Swedes are not going away any time soon, nor are the British police, who are waiting to arrest him and extradite him to Stockholm the minute he attempts to leave his temporary sanctuary. Assange's troubles in Sweden go back almost exactly two years. The first sensational intelligence and diplomatic leaks had already hit the public domain. In the American government's eyes, Assange had become public enemy number one. But for many others around the world, he was a cause celeb. But for all their power and influence in the world, they had seemed impotent to stop the leaks or somehow make Assange pay for what they saw as espionage. When it emerged that two young Swedish women were pressing charges against him, alleging rape and molestation in somewhat curious circumstances, and extradition proceedings began in the British courts, Assange alleged that America was somehow manipulating the whole process behind the scenes in order to in turn extradite him back to the US and face the judicial music there. On the assumption that Assange can't stay in his Ecuadorian diplomatic sanctuary forever, and while we await the outcome of that standoff, Four Corners has gone back to Sweden, where the drama began, to pin down what actually happened there and take a closer look at the inconsistencies in the various versions of events. Here is Andrew Fowler's report. In late 2009, WikiLeaks set up home in the Iceland capital of Reykjavik. It was a perfect fit. Iceland has world-class internet. Its constitution forbids censorship. Julian Assange was made welcome. It was here that Assange received the first leaked cable of the now famous Cablegate documents. It centred on the US Embassy in Reykjavik. Birgitta Johns Dottir, an Icelandic MP, was working with WikiLeaks. She received an invitation to a cocktail party at the Embassy. Cocktail parties are mind-numbingly boring, uh, and I only go if I have a reason. So I actually decided, uh, I thought it was sort of uh, funny. Uh, and I'm a bit of a prankster sometimes. So uh, I decided it would be quite funny for me to go with one of the WikiLeaks people uh, to the embassy. She invited Julian Assange, but on the day of the cocktail party, she couldn't find him. Birgitta Johns Dottir decided not to go, but Assange did. In a moment of monumental chutzpah, Julian Assange inveigled his way into the cocktail party here at the US Embassy. He struck up a conversation with US diplomat Sam Watson. Several weeks later, Assange published confidential cables authored by the very same diplomat. Now, Sam Watson hadn't leaked, and neither had any of the other US Embassy staff. Nonetheless, there was a massive internal investigation. I think that many people thought that he had actually gone in and mysteriously sucked out the cables uh, uh, with some uh, spy device or something. But once the document came out, it was convenient to say it might have come from the embassy. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Which would have driven the United States intelligence agencies crazy trying to find out where this leak came from. Yes. Well, you know. They all need to have a reason to uh, earn their bread. It was the first act of humiliation by WikiLeaks of the world's greatest superpower, but it was nothing compared to what was to come. Item all up. Collateral murder. Come on, fire! 
the gunning down of unarmed civilians in a Baghdad street. Clear. And the Afghan warlocks. Eight months after his taunting of the US in Iceland, Assange landed in Sweden. He was now a cyber celebrity. I would say he was, it, it, it was like a pop star uh, arriving in Sweden. He made public appearances and many media companies wanted to, to talk, about, talk with him about uh, eventual cooperation with WikiLeaks. Assange had come to Sweden to speak at a conference, but he was also there for more intriguing reasons. To negotiate the use of a former underground nuclear fallout shelter that stores internet servers. It would provide first-class security against the prying eyes and ears of the world's intelligence agencies. The bomb shelter houses the computer hardware of Rick Folkving's Swedish pirate party. We contacted them first as an just offering service space, right? It might sound like a wacky organization, but in Sweden, it's taken seriously enough to have a member in the European Parliament. The parties close to WikiLeaks. So we knew about them, they knew about us. We yeah. saw they were, in problem, they were in trouble and we said, hey guys, we might be able to help you out here. Folkving offered WikiLeaks some space in the bunker. It's an amazing place, to be honest. But yeah, that's where we offered them um, hosting space. I don't know how they're using it. I shouldn't know how they're using it. That would interfere with my interests. But I understand it got quite some attention worldwide that WikiLeaks is now hosted in a nuclear bomb-proof fallout shelter. Assange was on a roll. Stockholm, August the 16th, 2010. Julian Assange caught a train from the central station. All the years of hard work were finally paying dividends for Julian Assange. Collateral murder had been released, so too had the Afghan war logs. But what would happen in the next few days would derail the WikiLeaks juggernaut. Assange was not travelling alone. His companion was Sophia Willen, a 26-year-old admirer. As Assange and Willen left the train to spend the night together, they could have no idea of the repercussions that would flow from their one-night stand. Assange's life would later descend into turmoil. Two days earlier, the faithful and adoring had gathered at the LO building, Stockholm's trade union headquarters. In the audience were two women, Sophia Willen in the pink cashmere sweater and Anna Arden. Assange was staying at Arden's flat. They'd slept together the previous night. Later, she would tell a friend she had a wild weekend with Assange. Sophia Willen was enthralled by the Assange phenomena. She texted during his talk, he looked at me. He came to Sweden on the 11th of August 2010 and uh, he had this apartment uh, where one of these women lived. She was supposed to be away uh, so he could stay there. Uh, but she came home on the n Friday night, 13th of August, and uh, then they had co-sensual sex. Uh, and he continued to stay in that apartment uh, until the 18th of August. Uh, but in the meantime, he made acquaintance with the other woman, and, and uh, one night he traveled to her town in Sweden, and they had co-consensual co co consensual sex. The sex with Sophia Willen in her apartment might have been consensual, but critically, there was a question over whether Assange had used a condom. 
The next day, Assange caught the train back to Stockholm. Willen stayed at home, worried about the possibility of an STD infection. She later rang Anna Ardin, Assange's lover of the previous week. Somehow, uh, the two women started to exchange text messages which, with each other and uh, started to discuss what had happened. And they ended up at the police station, but they did not f file any charges against Julian. Ardin and Willen went to central Stockholm's Clara police station to see if they could compel Assange to take an STD test, should he refuse. But the police interpreted what one of the girls said as uh, some sort of sex crime having been committed. Uh, and that resulted in a prosecutor uh, the same night issuing a warrant of arrest for Julian. It would become a tabloid journalist's dream. Sex, politics and international intrigue. How big a story has the Assange case been here? The Assange story has uh, been huge, of course, because you have... Thomas Matson is the editor of Expressen. Its story has so many aspects. You have the political question of whether this is a case created to damage WikiLeaks. At the time, though, Matson thought it was little more than a salacious scandal. I think that many people... In the beginning, people were like shaking their heads, thinking that if you are innocent, well, in that case, this is, cannot be a problem. Just show up, say that you're innocent, and you will most probably be cleared if that's the case. Assange, in fact, did go to the Swedish police 10 days after the first allegations were made. He was interviewed, but not charged with any offense, and he was free to leave the country while the inquiry continued. Mid-September, uh, he got uh, a message from his then lawyer that the prosecutor did not want him and that he was uh, for an interview and that he was free to leave Sweden. And under that assumption, he left Sweden in the afternoon of the 27th of September in good faith that he had uh, sought for and got uh, 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 approval from the prosecutor to leave the country. Assange made his way to London, holding up at the Frontline Club for Journalists. He had unfinished business with America. This disclosure is about the truth. Assange was at his peak, working with some of the most prestigious and influential media outlets in the world, including The Guardian and The New York Times. But ominously, 12 days after giving Assange clearance to leave the country, the Swedes issued a warrant for his arrest. Three weeks later, WikiLeaks launched the third big hit against America, the Iraq War Logs. This is warlogs.wikileaks.org. Then the Swedish prosecutor up to the ante. With Assange now working on the release of the biggest and most sensitive case of US cables yet, Sweden issued an Interpol red notice for his arrest. You only need to look at the way that red notices are used around the world. Red notices are normally the preserve of terrorists and dictators. The president of Syria does not have a red notice alert. Gaddafi in Libya at the same time Julian's arrest warrant was issued, was not subject to a red notice, but an orange notice. It was, an incredibly, um, it was incredibly unusual that a red notice would be sought for an allegation of this kind. The timing of the red notice could not have been worse. US Army soldier Bradley Manning had allegedly leaked more than a quarter of a million classified documents, and Julian Assange was anxious to get them out. They became known as Cablegate. There are so many thousands uh, of stories that have come from that and have influenced elections and have been involved uh, in the course of revolutions. 
The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure of classified information. It puts people's lives in danger, threatens our national security, and undermines our efforts to work with other countries to solve shared problems. An outraged Washington set up a crack team of Pentagon investigators to take on WikiLeaks. It even launched a legally questionable financial blockade to starve WikiLeaks of funds. For America, Cablegate was the final straw. Some even wanted Assange dead. This guy's a traitor, a treasonous, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a b Well, what about it? This little punk, now I stand up for Obama. Obama, if you're listening today, you should take this guy out, have the CIA take him out. If Assange was looking for support from home, he didn't uh, get it. And, you know, I absolutely condemn uh, the placement of this information on the WikiLeaks website. It's a grossly irresponsible thing to do and an illegal thing to do. The then Attorney General threatened to revoke his Australian passport. It was only because the federal police believed that Assange's passport was the best way to track him that he kept it. Well, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General are US lackeys. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. They had a whole of government task force involving every intelligence agency and the Australian Federal Police and the Department of Defence and him trying to work out um, how to uh, deal with WikiLeaks and me personally. Though the task force found that Assange had broken no law, his more immediate worry was that his extradition to Sweden would be a back door to onward extradition to the United States. For more than 500 days, Julian Assange and his legal team fought his extradition through the magistrates' courts, to the High Court, and on to the Supreme Court the most powerful court in the land. But on June the 14th, Julian Assange lost his final appeal. The Supreme Court ruled he'd have to be extradited. Five days later, Assange fled to the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Hello. Last month, we managed a brief phone call from a London hotel with Assange in the embassy. Oh, hang on, I'm just going to put the speakerphone on. One second, sorry. He revealed why he was seeking political asylum. Yes, there, there were a number of dramatic events that occurred just beforehand. Uh, first of all, the Swedish government publicly announced that it would uh, detain me without charge in prison uh, under severe conditions. On the same evening, the... UK government security contractors that maintain the electronic manacle around my leg uh, turned up unannounced at 10.30 p.m. Uh, and insisted on fitting another manacle uh, to my leg, saying that this was part of routine maintenance, which did not sound to be credible. Assange sensed the net was tightening around him. Then the next day, the Crown Prosecution Service uh, acting, we believe, on behalf of the Swedish government, requested that the 14 days that I had to apply to the European Court of Human Rights be reduced to zero. Assange is safe all the time he remains inside the embassy, but once he steps out, it's almost certain he'll be arrested and extradited to Sweden. The minute he, he hits Swedish soil, he will be arrested. He will be brought to a custody jail. He will be kept there in isolation for four days. He can only meet with me and my co-lawyer. On the fourth day, he will be brought into a courtroom in handcuffs in front of a custody judge. And they will decide whether he will be kept in custody up into, until the final court case is tried, or if, we, if he will be released. I will try to get him released, of course. But at least four days in Sweden, in Swedish prison, is, uh, uh, we can't avoid that. At the heart of the matter is whether the Swedish judicial authorities will treat him fairly. 
Certainly events so far provide a disturbing picture of Swedish justice. Using facts agreed between the defence and prosecution and other verified information, we've pieced together what happened during those crucial three weeks in August. On August the 11th, 2010, Assange arrived in Sweden to attend a conference organised by the Swedish Brotherhood, a branch of the Social Democratic Party. He was offered Anna Ardin's apartment while she was away, but Ardin returned home a day early on Friday the 13th. She invited Assange to stay the night and they had sex. She would later tell police Assange had violently pinned her down and ignored her requests to use a condom. Assange denies this. The following day, Assange addressed the conference with Arden at his side. Later that afternoon, Arden organised the Swedish equivalent of a top-notch barbecue, a crayfish party. She posted a Twitter message. Julian wants to go to a crayfish party. Anyone have a couple of available seats tonight or tomorrow? The crayfish party was held that night in a courtyard off her apartment. It went on until the early hours of the morning. Arden tweeted at 2 a.m. Sitting outdoors at 2 o'clock and hardly freezing with the world's coolest, smartest people. It's amazing. A guest at the party would later tell Swedish police the event was a very hearty evening. When he offered to put Assange up at his apartment, Arden replied, he can stay with me. In the past 24 hours, Arden had worked closely with Assange, had sex with him, organised a crayfish party on his behalf, and according to one witness, turned down alternative accommodation for him. It is during this same period that police will later investigate whether Assange coerced and sexually molested Anna Ardin. Well, if you send text messages like that, I've just spent some time with the coolest people in the world. Uh, the night after, you then say you were raped. I mean, you shouldn't write such text messages if you had been raped by that person the night before. Your client described Julian Assange as a cool man, I think one of the coolest men in the world that she'd had in her bed. I will argue in court. I have, of course, arguments concerning exactly what you're talking about now, but I will not tell any media of how I'm going to represent the women in, in court. I'm sorry. But can you see how that looks as though... Yes, of course I can. It's, I, know it's we, a, I, I can tell. Up. It looks as though they are, in fact, um, setting him up for yeah. this. I, I'm quite aware of that. Sunday, August the 15th, the next day. Assange attended a dinner party at Stockholm's Glenfiddich restaurant, organised by Pirate Party founder Rick Folkving. I think a lot of people at the, um, at the table had meat balls. I think Julie might have been one of them. Now, Swedish meat balls, that, that's a little bit like mom's apple pie in Sweden. As in, you can call my wife ugly, you can kick my dog, but the instant you say something bad about my mother's meat balls, I'm going to take it personal. Also at the dinner was Anna Ardin. So just to get this straight, uh, Julian Assange arrived with Anna Arden, and he left with Anna Arden. Yep. What was their behaviour like towards each other? Well, I was discussing mainly with Julian, and the uh, um, again, I can't go into too much detail here, but it was a, at least a very professional dinner. It was two high-level organisations, both intent on changing the world, behaving professionally. The fact that Anna Arden accompanied Julian Assange to this dinner and left with him, what does that say to you? Well, that's going into speculating on uh, merits of extradition, and I can't really do that. I think 
that be your presenting an objective fact, as did I. And if people want to read something into that, that's obviously ripe for doing so, but I can't spell it out. Four Corners has obtained a photograph lodged with police investigators from that evening. Anna Ardin is on the left. Afterwards, Assange would again spend the night at her apartment. The following day, August the 16th, Assange had sex with Sophia Willen at her apartment. According to police records, Ardin was aware that he had slept with Sophia. A witness told police he contacted Anna Ardin looking for Assange. She texted back, he's not here. He's planned to have sex with the Kashmir girl every evening, but not made it. Maybe he finally found time yesterday. That same day, the witness asked Ardin, is it cool he's living there? Do you want, like, for me to fix something else? According to the witness, she replied, he doesn't like sleep at nights, so that's a bit difficult. So he has a bit of a difficulty taking care of his hygiene, but it's okay, he lives with me. It's no problem. Three days later, on August the 20th, Willen, accompanied by Ardin, went to the Clara police station in central Stockholm to seek advice about whether Assange could be forced to take an STD test. Ardin had gone along primarily to support Willen. Sometime during Willen's questioning, the police announced to Ardin and Willen that Assange was to be arrested and questioned about possible rape and molestation. Willen became so distraught, she refused to give any more testimony and refused to sign what had already been taken down. The circumstances leading up to the issue of the arrest warrant gave cause for grave concern for Julian um, about the, the procedures that were adopted in the investigation. Um, we have to remember that when the announcement was put out that he would be subject to a warrant, um, one of the complainants was upset by that and later said that she felt railroaded by the police. Well, what happened is what was that the duty prosecutor got a phone call from the police and the duty prosecutor decided that he should be uh, arrested. And what happened? Uh, he was arrested in his absence, uh, but he, they de never got in, got in contact with him, so, but he was arrested in his absence. That's a technical, technical thing in Sweden, Swedish law, yeah. The prosecutor's office might not have contacted Assange, but within hours they let the whole of Sweden know what was going on, leaking to the Express and Tabloid the statements of Ardin and Willen. The newspaper front page read, Assange hunted for rape in Sweden. Julian wakes up the following morning to read the newspapers to hear that he's wanted for double rape and is absolutely shocked. Two of our reporters had information about Julian Assange and we also had a, a confirmation from the prosecutor which uh, uh, confirmed on record that there was a police investigation against uh, Julian Assange. It was now the case took a strange twist Within 24 hours, a more senior prosecutor dismissed the rape allegations, leaving only the lesser accusation of molestation. Assange willingly went to the police on August the 30th and made a statement. During the interview, he expressed his fears that anything he said would end up in the tabloid newspaper Expressen. The interviewing police officer said, I'm not going to leak anything. The interview was leaked. Why did you leak his name to, to, to a tabloid paper? How, how can you drop the case and reopen the case? And how can, you, uh, how can you not say that he waited for five weeks in Sweden voluntarily to participate in the investigation? Why do you have to arrest him? Why do you have to keep him in handcuffs? Uh, why can't you conduct this in a proper manner? The rest of the world sees it, but Sweden unfortunately does not. It's perhaps understandable that Assange had doubts he'd receive fair treatment from the Swedish authorities. 
On September the 15th, the prosecutor told Assange he was permitted to leave Sweden. Assange, back in England, would later offer to return within a month. The Swedish authorities said, too late. A second warrant had already been issued for his arrest. Uh, he says that he left the country and, um, and then was prepared to come back at any time. Is that your understanding? Well, I don't believe that. He, he says that he was prepared to come back in October, but the prosecutor wanted him back earlier. I don't know. I don't believe he wanted to... Uh, he was... He wanted to come freely back to Sweden. I don't think so. Can you understand that the Australian people may not understand how somebody can be accused in their absence when they haven't even been interviewed, uh, then have that rape case dropped, the arrest warrant removed, and then have it reinstituted all in the space of a few days? Yeah, I can very well understand the confusion, and, and uh, uh, that is very difficult to understand, uh, well, exactly how it works. Well, you call it confusing. It's, uh, it may be slightly more than that. Well, that's the way it works here in Sweden, so... Well, I, but I can understand the confusion, definitely. Assange, still hunkered down in the London Embassy, has no doubt what his fate will be if he's extradited. If I was suddenly taken to Sweden, I would not be in a position to apply for political asylum in relation to the United States. Um, it would be the, the end of the road. I would just be taken from one jail to another. The US has said specifically, the US ambassador to London said, they would wait to see what happened in Sweden. And so we are very concerned about the prospect that once matters are resolved in Sweden, he will, there will be an extradition request from there and he will not be able to travel home to Australia and will have to fight extradition in the Swedish courts. The US ambassador to Australia suggests that Washington isn't interested in the Swedish extradition. It's not something that the U.S. cares about, it's not interested in it, it hasn't been involved in it, and frankly, um, if he's in Sweden, um, there's a less robust extradition relationship than uh, there is between the U.S. and the U.K., so it, I, I think it's one of those narratives that has been made up, there's nothing to it. That's diplomatic speak. That doesn't mean anything. Their last statement three days ago by their spokesperson in Boyd says we are continuing our investigation of WikiLeaks. So you can't accept those words. Michael Ratner, Assange's New York lawyer, believes there's an easy solution to the issue. If they flatly said, um, we, do not, we will not prosecute Julian Assange, um, that would be a very different kind of statement. And, um, and they, it, you know, my view is they should say that. Um, I think they should say it, one, because then Julian Assange uh, could leave the Ecuadorian embassy, go to Sweden, deal with Sweden. Uh, and continue on with his life. But Ratner thinks that's not what the United States wants. He's convinced a grand jury is investigating WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Four Corners has obtained a copy of a subpoena from a grand jury, which is examining evidence for possible charges relating to conspiracy to communicate or transmit national defense information and obtaining information protected from disclosure from national defense. Critically, the subpoena contains the identifying codes 10 and 3793. There's a grand jury currently sitting um, in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. And the grand jury's number, and it's interesting, the grand jury's number is 10, standing for the year it began, GJ, which is grand jury, and then 3793. Three is the conspiracy statute in the United States, 793 is the espionage statute. So what they're investigating is 3793, conspiracy to commit espionage. Certainly anyone associated with Assange is feeling the heat of the US authorities. Icelandic activist Smari McCarthy worked on the collateral murder video. We caught up with him at a Reykjavik hotel. So what is it about WikiLeaks that changed everything? Uh, it industrialized the process of leaking. Oh, but, uh, McCarthy flew into Washington earlier this year to attend a conference. Security officials had him in their sights the moment he stepped off the plane. When I get 
out through the doorway, there's two border and customs control officers. Uh, one of them takes a look at my passport, says, ah, yes, this is a guy, and uh, they uh, walk with me away. McCarthy was questioned for several minutes about the reason for his trip before the border guards got to the point. And then about, like, uh, in the last couple of minutes, they say, well, you know, we're actually asking you these questions because we know you're affiliated with WikiLeaks. And I say, well, I was, but I'm no longer. Uh, and they ask, like, so you're not in contact with uh, Julian Assange? And I say, no, I have no contact with Julian. And they're like, oh, OK. And basically let me out. I'm on my way. But it wasn't the last McCarthy would see of the FBI. After the conference, McCarthy had a drink with friends before heading to the Washington Metro. He missed the last train. As he walked out of the archive station, two men confronted him. Two guys come up to me and, and address me by name and say they're FBI agents and would like to ask me some questions. And I say to them, well, I've had some beers and I don't have a lawyer, so no, I'm not going to answer any questions. They nevertheless give me a, a piece of paper with a phone number and an email address. Um, this was not a business card. This was a piece of paper. This was just a kind of uh, card file thing that was handwritten. And the email address was not at FBI.gov, as you would expect from FBI agents. Just why they wouldn't give an FBI email address puzzled McCarthy. And they say, well, they contain our full names. And I say, well, is that a problem? Well, uh, we're afraid that if, our full if we give you our full names, then there will be retaliation against us personally from Anonymous. The two men seemed worried he might be a member of the cyber hacker group Anonymous, which had worked with WikiLeaks. And I say, who the hell do you think I am? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not like the Grandmaster of Anonymous. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no, I, I don't even know anybody in Anonymous, right? McCarthy's experience could be dismissed as an oddity, but in the back streets of Paris, we found someone with a very similar story. Jeremy Zimmerman heads up an internet activist group. He's a WikiLeaks supporter. I'm a friend with Julian. I think he's a, he's a very intelligent and, and very witty person, and I enjoy very much the conversations we have together. Earlier this year, as he prepared to board a plane at Washington's Dulles Airport, two men approached him about his involvement with WikiLeaks. They didn't show any, any badge. So I didn't ask for one, but I saw their colleague um, maintaining the, the gate of the plane open. So I thought, you, you don't do that with a, you know, a university a library card. <laughs> so I thought... So you would, thought they must be FBI? I thought they, they, they must be FBI. And actually, the, the agent questioning me was a caricature of FBI agent, you know, with a, a large jaw, short hair, tight suit. And he said, well, your name was mentioned in a criminal investigation for conspiracy involving lots of people. And so which case he was referring to, it's the, the, the grand jury in Virginia. And so I asked him, thinking aloud, uh, if I understand correctly, either I talk to you or I take full responsibility for my actions in front of a judge during a fair trial. And this is where he replied immediately, have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been to jail? In an obvious attempt to intimidate me. What do you think? they were trying to achieve? Maybe it was to turn me into an informant, to try to send me, get information from Julian or whatever. I don't know. I will never know, probably. Zimmerman was stopped roughly at the same time, uh, coming back from a similar thing with, uh, with McCarthy. So I, 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 I don't know who would be tricking them into thinking they were FBI agents. What we've seen in a couple of these stops in the Assange WikiLeaks case is people introduce themselves as Homeland Security, at least in one instance, and not as FBI. And then when they get pushed a little, they have to admit they're FBI. Now, it's interesting when you think about it, these people have been hit by the FBI, and that's what also tells you uh, that this is a Justice Department investigation of civilians. 
Even Assange's UK legal advisor Jennifer Robinson appears to have been caught in the US dragnet. I'd had an incredibly long day at work and I was late to the airport. I rushed out to Heathrow, handed over my passport and the woman behind the desk was having a lot of difficulty. She couldn't check me in. She, she looked at me in a strange manner and said, well, this is odd, you're Australian, you're travelling home to Australia, you shouldn't need a visa. I said, well, no, I'm Australian, here's my passport, I'm going home. And she said, I can't check you in. A security officer took Robinson's passport away. She came back about 15 minutes later, um, carrying a mobile phone, handed my passport to the woman behind the desk and said, she's inhibited, we can't check her in until we've got approval from Australia House. Though Robinson was eventually allowed to catch the plane, she's still not received an explanation why she's on a so-called inhibited list. It doesn't appear to be an Australian government term, but US Homeland Security uses the phrase to identify people who need to be watched. Now back in England, she continues to be Assange's legal advisor. We caught up with her on a visit to the Ecuadorian embassy. Look, he is now preparing, um, gathering and preparing materials for the purposes of his application to the Ecuadorian authorities. And, and essentially now it's a matter for the, for the Ecuadorian government. How, how is he? How is he? What's his manner like? How's his, um, his humour? I've never known anyone to deal with the amount of stress that he's under as well as he does. He's in very good spirits and is still very committed to WikiLeaks' work. Um, he may be um, confined to the embassy, but as as he showed during house arrest, that doesn't stop him. Um, as we said, the last 18 months we've seen a television program, we've seen... Um, WikiLeaks, further WikiLeaks releases, so I don't think he'll let this stop him either. Assange's primary concern is that the Australian government has never properly addressed the central question, the near certainty that a grand jury is investigating WikiLeaks and the possibility of him being charged. We are very concerned about the prospect of potential extradition to the US. We need only look to the treatment of Bradley Manning. He's been held um, in pretrial detention for more than two years now in conditions for a large part of that detention which the UN Special Rapporteur said amount to torture. We are very concerned about the prospect of him ending up in the US and the risk of onward extradition from Sweden was always a concern and can remains a concern. Once in Sweden, he'd be at the mercy of a system which has a record of complying with US wishes. And there's evidence that Sweden has acted illegally in past extraditions involving the US. Sweden has frankly always been the United States lapdog, and it's not a matter we are particularly proud of. The Swedish government has um, essentially, whenever US official says jump, the Sweden government asks how high. If that seems like a heavy-handed comment, there's evidence to back it up. There was a famous case last decade where a couple of Swedish citizens were even renditioned by the CIA in a quite torturous manner to Egypt where they were tortured further, which goes against every part of Swedish legislation, every international agreement on human rights and not to say human dignity. A United Nations investigation later found against Sweden. The country was forced to pay compensation. For Assange, coupled with his other experiences of the Swedish judicial system, it is perhaps understandable that he fears ending up in Sweden. Uh, for me, the question really is, if I'm sitting in Julian Assange's position, I'd be very, very nervous because the United States gets their hands on you uh, in this case, and you're a goner. So, you know, what I get asked all the time is, well, how do you know? To me, the question isn't how I know. I know there's a lot of evidence out there that it looks like that. Uh, to me, the burden should be on the United States government to say, we are not planning to prosecute Julian Assange. If they just gave that assurance, I can guarantee you that Julian Assange would go to Sweden tomorrow. 
We approached Australia's Attorney-General Nicola Roxon to pose a number of questions related to the Assange case, but she was unavailable on holidays. Ultimately, some of our questions were answered by a foreign affairs spokesman by email on behalf of Foreign Minister Bob Carr. They're on our website. Next week on Four Corners, the woman who forecast her own brutal death but could find no one willing to listen. Until then, good night.